The Yoga of Finnegan's Wake, Pulling on a Tantric Thread, by Bridget O'Rourke and James Shaw. Sandias, Sandias, Sandias. So begins the final book of James Joyce's masterwork, Finnegan's Wake. Sandias is recited in the moment just before book four begins, in the interregnum or space between books, a moment of silence of indefinite duration. Uncharacteristically, Joyce spelled the Sanskrit word sandhya without modification. The word comes at a transformative moment in the wake, a get-and-go gap. It is both an ending and a beginning. Sandhya means the period between two world eons. It also means twilight, the moment between dark and light, sunset, and sunrise. Book four takes place principally at sunrise, with the matters of the night dissolving and with the portent of being replaced by the matters, forces, and beings of the new day. HCE and ALP are being replaced by their descendants. In Hindu culture and tradition, Sandhyas also refers to the obligation of one generation to the next. As he ascends, the son must pay obeisance to the father. These various meanings are readily available to James Joyce in the texts he is known to have consulted on Eastern thought while composing Finnegan's Wake. These include Heinrich Zimmer's Myths and Symbols in Indian Art and Civilization, one of the few books in Joyce's library with his own handwritten annotations. Joyce's friend and assistant Samuel Beckett also read Zimmer and delivered three pages of notes on it. Joyce also used the contested texts written by H.P. Madame Blavatsky, a founder of the Theosophical Society. Sandias, Sandias, Sandias also suggests a play on Sanctus, 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 part of the Eucharistic prayer in the Roman Catholic Mass, Holy, Holy, Holy. For some, it may also call to mind the Hindu chant at the end of many Western yoga classes, Shanti, 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 or Peace, Peace, Peace. Sandhya also echoes Sankhya, used in Book 1 in the wake. Sankhya Yoga is one of the Orthodox Vedic or Hindu schools or darshanas. The first few pages of Book 4 are replete with Sanskrit words, with many such multi-layered references to Hindu or Vedic and yogic practice and thought, including references from the Rig Veda. We begin with these concepts from the final book of the wake, and then work back around to the beginning and to other more specifically tantric yogic threads. Joyce suggests in line five that we see east. So let's take a look to the east. James Atherton observes that in book four, Joyce is reaching back historically to an ancient past and specifically to the Rig Veda, among the oldest existing texts in any Indo-European language, dating from somewhere between 1500 and 1200 BCE or even earlier. As Book 4 opens, Pu-Nuset, Lord of Risings in the Yonder World, speaketh. The following passage in the wake sounds much like the Vedic hymns dedicated to Pushan, the Hindu sun god. Bah, Suvarn, sir, scatter brand to the renewaler of the sky, thou who ignitest. Dah, Arcturus coming, B. Verb unprincipient through the transitive spaces. Kilt by Kelt shall kith again with kin again. We elect for thee, Tartangel. Svadesia salve. We Durbalanars, the Ajur. Away, the Margun, from our Astamite, through dim dum dun till light kindling light has led, we hope us. But hunt me the journey on, iter itinerant, the cal his course, amid the cemetery of Somniomnia, even unto Heliotropolis, the castellated, the enchanting. First, what do the Sanskrit words in this part of the text mean? Va means flow or lead, or perhaps go forward. 
Joseph Campbell has this as a command, addressed to the word to become flesh in the new cycle. Suvarn, sir. God of good shape. Sir means son, god or sage. Suvarn means beautiful color or gold, and thus the Sanskrit Suvarn, sir, god of good shape or golden. Agnitist. Agni is the ancient god of fire from the Vedas, among the most important of Vedic gods. Da. Burn, scorch. Turtangel. Turta, a sacred place, and a place of safe crossing of rivers. Svadesya. Self-guider, one who acts in accord with his own dharma. Durbalanars. Durvala means weak. Nar is men, thus weak men, or Dubliners. Margan. Marga, or path. Astamite. After sunset. Understanding these Sanskrit references opens up the text and ties this new day to the most ancient of times, places, and gods, Agni in particular, from the Rig Veda. Through such ancient references, past now pulls, a suggestion of karmic influence from the past onto and into the present and future. On page 596, we are reintroduced to HCE, the archetypal masculine figure in the text. The hundering, blundering, dunder, funder of plunder, sundered manhood. Behold, he returns, renascent, fincarnate, still foretold around the hearth side. Who is further described as without links, without impediments, with gigantogyres, with free flaw forms, parasama to himself, Atman as Evers. Without links, without impediments, has a strong Eastern and specifically Buddhist feel. The five hindrances or impediments that must be overcome on the path to liberation or nirvana. Parasama is Sanskrit for another equal to himself, or again, the self-guided. And this is Atman, the critically important Hindu yogic self. Mircea Eliad describes Atman as pure being, the absolute, by whatever name it may be called, the self. This prime mover or archetypal energy underlies all surface manifestations of apparent self and being. Astronomically fabula figured, as Jambudvispa Vipra foresaw of him. Jambudvipa is the continent around Mount Meru the Hindu mythological center point of the universe and the source of the three great real and mythological rivers, the center and source of the universe itself. Readers of Finnegan's Wake will note that the archetypal feminine ALP is associated with rivers, the Liffey in particular. Vipra means wise or inspired. Our wise self-guider, Atman, has his source in the very center of the power of the universe. Here we see the vibrant underlying force of the universe expressing itself as HCE, ALP, as Finn, as Shem and Sean, and all the other elements and features of the universe. On the next page, we are told there are two sides, the west and the east, the falling asleep and the waking up. Vidnis Sharvan Sanjivana. Shiva the great Hindu god, bringing the corpse back to life, and Lok, a shaft of shivery in the act, a nihilancinant. Here, Shiva, who typically carries a trident or shaft, annihilates, but also Shiva in the act. Shiva is a god of great sexual power. He is represented as a lingam, a phallus, in his consort or feminine expression, Shakti, as a yoni, or vagina, uterus, or womb. The combined object of Shiva Shakti in the act is a classic expression in Hindu yogic and most especially tantric yogic iconography of the blissful state of enlightenment, samadhi, the state of freedom from illusion, maya. So, a flash of light through the illusory confusion. Fayans, where did thoughts come from? It is infinitesimally fevers, resty fever, risey fever, 
a coranto of aria, sleeper awakening in the smalls of one's back, presentiment, gip, and again gipe, a flash from a future of maybe maha my ability through the winder of a wonder in a wilder is a welter, as a warble of a warble is a world. Tom. Maha Maya ability. The Hindu yoga concept of Maya, illusion, and Maha, great. The sleeper awakens with a flash from the future, annihilating, at least for the moment, the great illusion that comprises the world as we in our unenlightened state see it. In other words, a moment of enlightenment is upon us, breaking through the wonder wilder welter warble warble world. Padma brighter and sweetster, this flower that bells. It is our hour, or risings, tickle, tickle, lotus spray. Till here next, adya. As Joseph Campbell outlines this myth, from the navel of the sleeping god Vishnu, whose dream is the universe, a golden lotus blossoms forth at the opening of each new cycle of existence. This lotus is the universe of his dream. Padma is Sanskrit for lotus, another name for the goddess Lakshmi, Vishnu's consort or feminine aspect. Adya can be taken as amen, or as Roland McHugh has it, now or today. But it is also part of the name of the goddess Adya Shakti, the power from which the entire universe is generated, as noted earlier, combined with Shiva. Take thanks. Thanks, Tom, Thomas, in that European end meets end. About which Campbell says, this is the moment of Sandhya's junction, when the opposites come together. Europe and India, empirical knowledge and intuitive wisdom are now one. The word adya returns as adyantans, which McHugh has as a combination with anta, or end, so it becomes now and at the end, or just now end. Again, we are in a sandhya, a space-time gap, both beginning and end, and neither, a pause, a moment in suspension and awe. The text continues, To them in Isat Loka, hearing the herb it orbs, thens now with nows then intense continuant, heard. Isat Loka, McHugh has loka as the universe or any subdivision of it, and this is fine. However, loka is also state of mind or being, and satya means true, a state of mind or being of truth or enlightenment. Zimmer describes this state as something like a heavenly rebirth, not full liberation, but a step in that direction. But he also describes satya loka as the seventh chakra, the sahasrara or crown chakra, the point at which Shiva Shakti are united. In the Rigveda, Satyaloka is the host or the abode of the gods, of which Agni is the leader. Joyce here is referring to a place and a state of mind of the highest order, true wisdom, Samadhi. The age of the Madaman Vantora of Gross Guy and Little Lee Lady. In Hindu Vedic mythology, there are four great ages, or yugas of the universe. A single cycle of the four stages lasts 4,320,000 years and is called a Maha Yuga. We are currently in the fourth stage, or yuga, the Kali Yuga, which duration is 432,000 years. A Maha Manvantara is one complete cycle of all four ages gone round three times, and including one Sandhya at the end and others separating the yugas. And note that the wake itself has small sandhyas, or silences, at key points. Blavatsky says the complete Maha Manvantara has 4,320 million years. Her math is complex, but suffice it to say that the number 432 has its own prominence in the wake. This Kali Yuga we are in matches perfectly with the structure of the wake, and particularly the content of Book 4. The Kali Yuga is a period of disillusion, of things falling apart, ending. The past golden age, the first yuga, Krita or Satya Yuga, 
the age of truth and light has passed, as have the next two. As the world cycles down into the fourth, heading straight for doomsday. Here is Wendy Doniger's explication from her controversial and important book, The Hindus and Alternative History. But time in India is not only linear, but cyclical, unlike Greece, for the end circles back to the beginning again. The cosmos is reborn over and over again, as each successive Kali age ends in a doomsday fire and a flood that destroys the cosmos, but is then transformed into the primeval flood out of which the cosmos is recreated undergoing a sea change in a new cosmogony. The idea of circular cosmic time is in part the result of Indian ideas about reincarnation, the circularity of the individual soul. The ending precedes the beginning, but the end and the beginning were always there from the start, before the beginning and after the end. It seems she could just as well be describing the wake instead of an ancient Indian Puranic text. And out of these regenerations, out of the gloam and clouds and the fog, steps Kevin. A naked yoga priest, clothed of sun dust, his oaky doped with frondous leaves, offrand to the Iwan of her Owen, Tazyam Kuru Salila Kriyamu, Faf! Taziam Kuru Salila Kriyamu is from the Hindu epic poem, the Ramayana, and expresses one of the central themes of Book 4. It is a directive to the Hindu hero and incarnation of Vishnu, Ram, at the death of his father to perform the last rites in water, that is, to give obeisance to the father who is being supplanted by the son and to do so in the water of the river Ganges, or Liffey. O oh, best one among men, River Ganja is the elder daughter of Himavanta, and O oh, dexterous one, you have to offer water oblation to the departed paternal uncles of yours in her waters, namely the holy waters of River Ganja. And then a reference to Tat Tram Asi, the mystical Vedic aphorism declaring the unity of the individual with the universal, Brahman. From thee to thee, thou art it thou, that thouest there. The twenty-eight plus one maidens hail Kevin's arrival. He is the birthless and deathless one, O Jarama. Kevin here may be reasonably seen as Shiva, the god of yogic practice and the model ascetic, who in other guises or parts of his narrative can also become a prodigious lover and sexually prolific. And this version of the story of St. Kevin is very similar to the version of the Hindu myth of Kandu as told in Zimmer and retold in Blavatsky of the great ascetic yogi man who gained godlike powers through his yoga practice. The gods, fearing his growing power, sent a beautiful apsara, or nymph, to tempt him away from his ascetic practice with sexual pleasure. In the Hindu story, the apsara is successful, at least for a time. Maybe 900 years or so of sexual bliss ensues. However, Kandu eventually wakes from the pleasure state and finds full moksha or release in another yogic practice, that of bhakti yoga or devotion, obeisance to God. As the story shifts to Kevin and his more Christian-centered rites on the lake, the Sanskrit references begin to slow. Yet the story still closely tracks with yogic ages. All the matters of the night are dissolving, just as at the end of the Kali Yuga, the universe heads toward dissolution and, finally, complete destruction, fire, and flood. But it seems this Buddha, or Buddhi, mind, is destined to be here for only a day, and Sean steps forward. And recalling that the Kali Yuga ends after 432,000 years, at this moment, St. Patrick is set to arrive in Ireland, metaphorically, if not quite historically, in the year 432. As Book 4 shifts to the perspective of ALP, the Sanskrit yogic references wash out of the text. Yet the streams becoming, 
the entireties of lives living being the one substance of a stream's becoming. This feminine perspective is essential to the wake and to its yogic thread. Samsara is referred to in Buddhist texts as the stream of becoming. It is Maya. It is everyday karmic life and history as it unfolds, repeats, returns cyclically. Thus, ALP and the very movement of the river is the essential yogic element of Maya, illusion, the world itself, and also Shakti, the feminine aspect of the combined Shiva Shakti. Book four ends with its own Sandhya, the long blank space before returning to the beginning of the new first age or yuga. This is leafy speaking. This is the silent fecund moment before circling back to the beginning. The world disintegrates at the end of the fourth yuga and the fourth book of the wake and then reassembles and begins again at the beginning of book one, the first yuga. And this points toward another, more specific Eastern influence in the wake, that of Tantric Yoga. An essential feature of Tantrism is the equation of Samsara with Nirvana. That is, Nirvana, liberation, can only be found in the world of birth, death, and rebirth. Liberation is in the very details of ordinary life. Samsara and Nirvana are two sides of the same reality. As Stephen says in Ulysses, That is God, a shout in the street. Or from Wendy Doniger, Tantra thus offered the best of both worlds, or as the Tantric mantra has it, Bhakti Mukti, Boksha Moksha, or Boga Yoga, enjoyment release, sensual delight and spiritual flight. And so it all ended. Arta, Kama, Dharma, Moksha. Ask Kavya for the K. Like the word Sandhyas, this Sanskrit phrase is given without alteration, ambiguity, or syncretization. These are the four essential aims of life in yoga. Arta is success. Kama is pleasure. Dharma is more complicated to translate, but means path, religion, law or justice. Moksha is liberation or enlightenment, release, as Doniger has it, from suffering and ignorance. In many Hindu texts, only the first three are considered, as they are the aims of the typical householder, suggesting that for the householder, the aim is to achieve a high rebirth, recalling the Satya Loka, Moksha, then, is reserved for the ascetic, the renunciate, or the person dedicated to spiritual pursuit in any case. Others, and most especially the tantric schools and texts that developed in the 7th through 10th centuries CE, considered moksha to be the aim of all, and available to all, and not requiring the renunciation of success and pleasure, but even achieved through success and pleasure. The Kama Sutra is not simply a sex manual, but a guide to moksha through pleasure. Joyce develops his own version of such a tantric sex manual in the Dolphin Kev episode. Here we have what can reasonably be referred to as a lascivious image. As Campbell has it, Dolph here has drawn a picture of his mother's genitals, pubic hair and all. But it is also a depiction of Yeats's gyre. McHugh and others note that this paragraph is directly tied to Yeats's A Vision, from which the vortex is taken, and the wake clearly identifies it with the vortex in the marginal note on page 293 and in other places. Joyce's diagram is both a depiction and parody of Yeats. It takes Yeats's rather esoteric symbolism and discourse right down to earth, and in a very tantric way, depicting the sexual energy within it. Yeats had been in a deep study of Indic thought, and specifically Tantrism, including its practice, 
while developing his thinking around the gyre and vortex. And there is a third image which can be associated with these two, the Yoni Yantra. Typically, though not always, in tantric symbolism, the upward-pointing triangle is phallic or male, and the downward, yonic or female, the combined object referring back to the image of Shiva Shakti. The tie to yogic and tantric imagery continues on page 294, where the left-hand marginal notes refer to the Sanskrit sarga, or the path of outgoing. That is, from McHugh, the process of world creation, letting go, voiding. Joyce explores the characteristics of the world underlying this yogic path in Book 2. Docetism and Didacism, Maya Thaya, Tamas, Rajas, Sattvas. Tamas, Rajas, and Sattvas are the three constituent parts or characteristics of all matter, according to Hindu, yogic, and tantric thought. Another way to say it is, as Campbell does, the three gunas, or qualities of maya, which constitute the nature of the world. They are, respectively, inertia, activity, and harmony. Sattvas refers back to, and is etymologically the same as sat, discussed earlier as in Satya Loka, the abode of truth. The next few pages of The Wake take us deeply into an exploration of the unity of opposites, and into Yeats's A Vision and the gyre vortex, which itself is a product of a dialectical set of oppositions, and also into the geometry of triangular shapes, of course, the sigla used by Joyce for ALP is the triangle, pointing up. We learn the mathematics of the unification of HCE and ALP. Joyce then takes us deep into the esoterics of tantric yoga, on the left-hand margin of page 303. Force centers of the fire serpentine, heart, throat, navel, spleen, sacral, Fontanella, intertemporal eye. These are the well-known yogic chakra centers through which the serpentine kundalini force, shakti, rises, unspiraling from the base just below the genitals, through the genitals, up into the heart center and beyond, culminating at the crown of the head in the thousand-petaled lotus at which Shiva and Shakti are joined, the Satya Loka. This is moksha, liberation. As we are told, up and at em, boys. Upanishadam. As this dense controversy nears its conclusion, as it approaches its own sandhya, silence, we hear the familiar call from the beginning of Book 4. Thou and shanty, thou and scanty shanty, Thou and slanty, scanty, shanty. This references Sanctus, 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 as well as the familiar yogic chant, Shanti, 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 and the beginning of Book 4, in the gin and go gap of Sandias, Sandias, Sandias. Sandhyas. Sandhyas. 